ओम नम भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नम भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नम भगवते वासुदेवाय Before I begin my lecture on the Srimad Bhagavatam I would just like to say a few words about thanksgiving On Thanksgiving day I did a program at the Valley Hindu Temple in Chatsworth Northridge area Their temple they have more than 20 deities That temple invites me twice a year Thanksgiving day and New Year's day. So, I gave a talk just before the RT. And so I just like to acknowledge that in my life I am also very very thankful. I'm thankful to my parents. although they are not were not hindu my parents brought me up very religiously my parents brought me up very strictly my father had only one vice of course to him it was not a vice because it was allowed in his catholic religion he ate meat But other than that he never drank liquor he had no illicit sex connection he was very honest truthful regularly attended his catholic church every day so he taught me good values he was my first guru Every Sunday after church he would give me uh classes on the Bible. And my mother she was spiritual. She was very progressive for her uh age and for her uh what is that called generation. So I'm grateful that I had good pious religious parents then of course the thing i'm most grateful is that i came in contact with his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami prabhupad which definitely changed my life most likely saved me from an early death saved me from drugs and all kinds of sinful activities i'm grateful to prabhupad his disciples who trained me and his movement which still survives and which has expanded when prabhupad left in 1977 there were 108 temples worldwide now there are over 600 so the movement of prabhupad has definitely expanded and is surviving the next thing i'm grateful for is my wife she has been a great influence on me she gives me unlimited support She encourages me to do this full-time preaching while she takes upon herself as her service to work a job and maintain the household and all I get to do is hear chant and travel the world and preach with her blessings. I'm grateful 
to this temple. I'm grateful to this temple because you allow me the privilege of speaking the science of God. It is a privilege. I must always remember and not take it for granted. This is sitting here and speaking on Krishna consciousness is a privilege. Therefore, I must take it very, very seriously. And I want to thank the management of this temple all these years giving me this facility. And I thank you, the congregation, for tolerating me and uh, hearing. So, last but definitely not least, I'm thankful to Krishna. I have told the story many times when I was five years old I knew instinctively that God is in my heart but it was not confirmed until I came across Bhagavad Gita so it was confirmed I didn't read that in any Bible or anything but in Bhagavad Gita when I started reading it was confirmed. I'm grateful to Krishna that he has saved me time and time and time and time again. Trinadapi suniche na tarariva sahishnuna amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari. This verse is the most important verse that I have learned of all the shlokas. I consider this shloka the key to success in life. That if I can always remain meek and humble, if I can tolerate without any complaint the various upheavals and disturbances in my life, if I can see or try to see Krishna in everybody's heart, even my enemy, I still have to try to see Krishna's in my heart. And if I can become completely free from any kind of desire for praise and adulation, then I will be successful in my life's ultimate goal. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama Iva Kivalam, Kalo Nasyeva Nasyeva, Nasyeva Gatiranyata. This mantra is what I live by and what I live for. After studying Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and all of Prabhupada's other books, the conclusion is that in this day and age, the age of quarrel, hypocrisy, confusion, the Iron Age of Kali, the only feasible means of perfection, the only true method to achieve God-realization or self-realization is to chant the Hare Krishna Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Those of you who are familiar with my preaching, you have understood that this is the thing I hammer in every lecture. Every lecture I have to emphasize that the process of God-realization, the bona fide method of self-realization, is the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. That is the theme, that is my mission in life, to chant and to preach the message of Krishna Nam the holy name 
of Krishna. So a few weeks ago, I began a new uh, series of talks. This is number four. This is called The Value of Human Life. So I've gone through the whole Srimad Bhagavatam and selected those verses which explain the value of human life. Tonight's verse, and we may cover several, is spoken by Sanat Kumar at the beginning of creation when Lord Brahma is engineering the construction of the universe. He, first of all, creates the four Kumaras. <coughs> These four Kumaras are great, highly advanced, transcendental scientists. But in order to simply dedicate themselves to transcendental knowledge, they decided to keep themselves as young five-year-old boys. There's four of them. Sanat, Sanaka, Sanatana, and uh, I can't think of the fourth one. It's all sun something. So, uh, Sanat Kumar he is the speaker for tonight's selections and he's speaking to Maharaj Prithu the story of Maharaj Prithu is found in the fourth canto and it's many chapters the whole kata of Prithu is many chapters this King Prithu was produced by the churning of the dead body of King Vena. King Vena was a demoniac king, so demoniac, he declared himself God. And he told everyone, don't worship Krishna, don't perform sacrifice, everything should go through me. So the Brahmins and sages became very disturbed hearing such unbelievable nonsense coming from the executive head. Now normally, Brahmins and Rishis do not get involved in politics. That's not their business. But in this case, they, they realized, no, we have to do something. Because the people are suffering because of this demonia king, Vena. So, the sages, by uttering high-sounding mantras, were able to kill him. Just by uttering high-pitched mantras, they killed him. But as soon as this King Vena is killed, another problem arises. Because there's no strong king, rogues, thieves, dacoits, they start to become prominent. So they solved one problem, but created another. Now the people again are suffering. Because if there is simply chaos, rogues and thieves, the people in general, they suffer. So, the Brahmins and sages, they knew so many different things. So they churned the dead body of King Vena by a mystic process. And first, from the churning of the limbs of King Vena came out this pygmy called Bahuka and he was the karmic result of all of King Vena's sinful activities and so they ordered him this Bahuka 
you go and live in the forest and don't disturb society. So he accepted the advice of the Brahmins and sages. Then they churned the arms of King Bena and out came Maharaj Prithu. And this Maharaj Prithu was a Shakya Avesha avatar, an empowered living entity like a incarnation of Krishna, empowered living being like Vyasadev is a Shakya Avesha avatar. Somebody is given specific potency by God to act. So this Maharaj Prithu, he became the emperor and he's a empowered representative of God and so now there is peace in society. Just like when Lord Ram ruled the earth. Ram was strong but he was ideal. So the people of Ayodhya lived very happy. Ram Raja. Not like Trump Raja. Ram Raja. We'll have to see what happens. Stay tuned. So same way when Prithu was ruling, there was peace and happiness. Then there are other incidents in Prithu's life. Mother Earth, one time, she restricted the supply of food grains. So the people were starving. So Prithu challenged Mother Earth, I'm going to cut you in two with my bow and arrow if you do not produce the grains so that my people can live. And Mother Earth said, the reason I'm not giving the grains is because the people are not doing sacrifice. So Prithu then was able to pacify Mother Earth and the seeds and the grains and people started to get sustenance. Then another incident in Prithu's life Indra, you all know Indra, he's famous for doing 100 horse sacrifices. That's one reason why he's king of heaven. Even when Bali took over the heavenly planets, the first thing the Brigu sages said to Bali, if you're going to sit on Indra's throne, you have to do 100 horse sacrifices. And then you all know what happens after that. So Prithu also wanted to do 100 horse sacrifice. He did 99. Indra got jealous. So that final horse, Indra disguised himself and stole the horse. So Prithu said, okay, no problem, get another horse. But each time they wanted to do the 100th horse, Indra would come disguised as a saintly person and steal the horse. So, Prithu's son, Vijitashva, he realized, no, 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 this is not some saintly person. He knew this was Indra being rascal. So he was going to kill Indra, but he was stopped. Probably Lord Brahma stopped him and said, no, you can't do that. So then at that moment, Lord Vishnu arrived. Lord Vishnu arrived and he spoke to Indra and Prithu. Vishnu said, Prithu, here's Indra. He's come to beg forgiveness from you. You should give him forgiveness. Prithu, he's a great devotee incarnation of God. Naturally, he forgave Indra. And then Vishnu mildly, mildly chastised Prithu by saying, Prithu, you already self-realized. Why are you doing a hundred horse sacrifices? It's not necessary. Let Indra be famous for his hundred. You've done 99. 
Just let it go. So, of course, by the presence of Lord Vishnu and Lord Narayan, everybody becomes pacified. Just like if Lord Narayan was to walk in the door right now, everybody would change. Everybody. We, regardless of who you, everyone would, we would be completely different. So, Lord Vishnu was very pleased with Prithu Maharaj. And he said, you are going to soon be visited by Sanat Kumar. And he will give you nice transcendental knowledge. So, that's also a large chapter in this fourth canto. One verse, and there's more. Let's see how far I go. One verse is about the value of human life. If you're ready, repeat after me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. I forgot to mention, I wanted to mention at the very beginning, that you have come here to hear the message of Godhead. This is most auspicious in your life. By agreeing to hear the message of Godhead, there's nothing better you could be doing for your own personal auspiciousness. So please, never take this opportunity cheaply. Hearing the message of Godhead is most auspicious for you. Materially, what to speak of spiritually. There is this powerful verse in the first canto. Srinbatang Svakata Krishna Punyasravana Kirtanaha Hridiantatsdo Hi Abhadrani Didhu Noti Surit Satam. You all know Krishna is in your heart. When Krishna sees that you are hearing his message, Krishna becomes very happy in your heart. What does he do? He reciprocates by cleansing material desires from your heart. And when your heart is clean, prasanatma, full happiness when your heart is clean. So, Krishna is the benefactor of the honest devotee. So if, if you have come with a clean heart, that you simply want to hear the message, Krishna will bless you unlimitedly and remove anxiety. You don't need a psychiatrist. If you have any kind of mental problem, all you need to do is hear Krishna Kata. Just go on hearing, your anxiety will go away. So Sanat Kumar, one of the four Kumars, he's instructing Maharaj Prithu. So what does he say? My dear king, it has been conclusively decided in the scriptures after due consideration that the ultimate goal for the welfare of human society is detachment from the bodily concept of life and increased and steadfast attachment for the Supreme Lord who is transcendental beyond the modes of material nature. This Srimad Bhagavatam is so nice. Prabhupada, I heard Prabhupada speaking. And he said that Bhagavatam is so nice, one shloka can actually solve everything. One shloka. So let's look at what Sanat Kumar said. First of all, it has been conclusively decided. Sanat Kumar and his brothers they are transcendental professors. They are also 
Shakti Adesh avatars. What are they empowered with? Transcendental knowledge. That is the specific potency that they've been given by Krishna. They are experts at transcendental knowledge, which is why Prithu is hearing. Prithu is another Shakti Vesh avatar, but he's hearing from another authority, the Kumaras, who are known for their transcendental knowledge. So what is he saying? Conclusively decided in the scripture. So yes, not conclusively decided by empirical evidence. No, by the scriptures. The scriptures are Vedic scriptures, by the way, are called Aparusheya. Aparusheya means our scriptures are not man-made. This is a very, I mentioned this in the past. This is a very important point. Do not think that our Vedic scriptures are man-made. Other religions, yes, not the Vedic scriptures. Therefore, the word is used, apaurusheya, not spoken by someone with the four inherent defects. Every conditioned soul has four def defects. Imperfect senses. Anybody doubt that? Are your senses perfect? With imperfect senses, what do you do? You commit mistakes. Anybody not make mistakes? Now, with those mistakes, what happens? We tend to fall into illusion. And then the last defect, which is common for politicians, cheating propensity. And you all know when April 15th comes, how you are tempted. Because you hate the fact that you have to give that damn government your hard-earned money. And your, some of you probably have different accountants and they're trying to help you. Anyway, these are the four defects of a conditioned soul. So the scriptures are not compiled by ordinary human beings. You all have read Mahabharata. So in the Mahabharata, you get a glimpse of how great Srila Vyasadeva is. His stature is par excellence. The compiler of this Srimad Bhagavatam is Vyasadeva, who compiled Srimad Bhagavatam on the order of his spiritual master Narada Muni. That's you can read about in the first canto. How Vyasadeva one day woke up, he was bewildered, and Narada immediately came and gave him instruction. You're bewildered because although you have compiled the four Vedas, Puranas, Itihasas, Shishi Radha Raman, Bhagavan Kijai, the Vedanta Sutra Mahabharata, you forgot to do one thing. You forgot to describe Krishna and his devotees and devotional service. And that is what Srimad Bhagavatam is. That's all it's about. Srimad Bhagavatam is the science of God. What is God? Who are his devotees? And what is the relationship between God and his devotees? Which the Sanskrit word is bhakti. The relationship between God and his devotees is bhakti. Devotional service. So, Prithu is saying, in all the scriptures, this thing that I'm going to say, conclusively decided. Conclusively. There's no doubt about it. The ultimate goal for, now this is for all of human society. All of it. Not just Hindus. No. All of human society. This is another thing which attracts me. Because 
when you read the Vedic literatures, you come to get a Catholic viewpoint. Cat, the word Catholic in this sense means universal. Universal outlook. So here, Sanat, Sanat Kumar is saying, the ultimate goal for human society, detachment from the bodily concept of life. That sounds awful familiar, which we find in the very first instruction of your Bhagavad Gita. Very first instruction. When Arjuna surrenders, because Arjuna was confused, lamenting, dropped his bow, didn't want to do his duty, didn't want to fight, but he had enough sense. Shishyasteham shadimang twang prapanam. Now I surrender to you, Krishna. Instruct me. Don't be my friend. Be my guru. That's like I have a doctor. My doctor loves me. I even have a picture of me and him hugging. He's great. He loves me. He thinks I'm wonderful. But when it comes to diagnosing me, I don't want him to fool around. Tell me the truth, which he does. He tells me, you got to lose 50 pounds, you got to do this, you got to, okay? But he's very good with me, but I value the fact that he doesn't play games. He tells me. Because the, the blood work comes back and he says, okay, you got this, this, that. You got to do this, this, this. That's a good doctor. So Arjuna is the same way. So immediately when Arjuna surrenders to Krishna, Krishna slaps him. First thing he says, you talk like a learned man, but no learned man talks like you. And then Krishna begins. The first instruction, Arjuna this material body is not you. You're not your mind. You are eternal spirit soul. And from there, Bhagavad Gita proceeds. And it's interesting. Although it's explained in chapter 2 in 20 verses, Krishna again goes back to it in chapter 13. So it's kind of a big thing. And if you've studied Prabhupada's lectures, right, there's... Hundreds and hundreds of Prabhupada's lectures. I've listened to many of them. If you listen to Prabhupada's lectures, whether it's in India or in America or Australia, because Prabhupada preached all over the world, you'll notice if you listen to Prabhupada's lectures, one thing he'll say repeatedly, you're not your body. Because if that's not understood, don't try to go to Rasa Leela because you're not going to understand it. First, you have to understand that you're not your body. And he hammers that lecture after lecture. So, Sanat Kumar, detachment from the bodily concept of the... But now, the second part. Just being detached from the bodily conception of life is not enough. Okay, there's a second part. Increased and steadfast attachment for the Supreme Lord. So now the question will automatically arise. Well, who is that Supreme Lord? Now he says, next thing, he is transcendental. Beyond the modes of material nature. In Sanskrit, that word is Adhokshaja. That's another name of God. Adhokshaja. Transcendental, beyond the modes of nature, beyond the range of the senses to independently verify. Which is why the scientists will never see God in their laboratories or their telescopes. Because that's not how God is revealed. 
the, the atheist, or I should say the agnostic. The agnostic says, I will believe in God when he shows me, as if he's going to appear on television, or he's going to appear at the Super Bowl. No. In fact, Krishna was here 5,000 years ago in India. He showed he was here. And how many people understood? Very few. Pandavas, the, even the Yadu dynasty didn't correctly understand Krishna. You'll read that in the Bhagavatam. The Yadu dynasty did not properly understand their Krishna. Pandavas did, Kunti did. Gopis, the Vrindavanites, they did. Kamsa didn't. All the demons that Krishna killed, they didn't. Even Brahma was a little confused. Indra, we all know. Indra, what did he say? This over-talkative child, Krishna. Even he was confused. So Krishna was already here 5,000 years ago. People didn't get it. So, what is the process by which God is revealed? That's the question. Prabhupada used to say that. I'll believe in God when you show me. So the re response is, okay, you'll believe in God when he shows you. Are you prepared to practice the process by which God will be revealed? That they're not willing to do. Because that process requires surrender. And that process requires bhakti devotional service. It's very clear in Bhagavad Gita. Once, twice, three times, Krishna says, You want to know me? Bhakti. You want to see me? Bhakti. You want to come to me? Bhakti. Not karma, not jnana, not yoga, other than bhakti yoga. And there are so many verses in the Upanishad and throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. Same thing is explained. God is revealed when your senses are purified by the process of devotional service and gradually, gradually, spurati adaha. Spurati is the Sanskrit word. Revealed. Krishna is revealed to you. And when Krishna reveals himself, you will be seeing Krishna always. You will always be sensing, feeling the presence of Krishna. Like Prahlad. Whenever we come to the month of May, the appearance day of Lord Nrsingha. So when that comes, I always go through the whole Prahlad Nrsingha section in the Bhagavatam. And there's that nice description of Prahlad. How as a five-year-old boy, he could feel Krishna's hand on his. Okay? So Krishna is revealed gradually as your senses become purified. I've said hundreds and hundreds of times, nobody is going to chant Hare Krishna mantra two hours every day and not get something from it. You know for sure I wouldn't. If this Hare Krishna mantra didn't work, I would have quit after two days. I don't, ex and Prabhupada told us, don't accept a post-dated check. No, what does Bhagavad Gita tell us? Pratyakshavagamam, that word is in the ninth chapter, second verse. Pratyakshavagamam. Krishna consciousness is perceivable by you. You all had experience when you're taking prashad. 
Do you need anybody's certificate? No, you know. Hmm. This is very nice. You don't need anybody else's verification. You perceive it yourself. How nice is the chole? How nice is the cheesecake? You know she's famous for cheesecake, right? She makes cheesecake. She does New York style better than New York. Yes. I know. I know what is good cheesecake. That is your Shakti from Krishna. You have been given that. Right? Or Gujaratis, you make that rus. Right? Mango rus. Right? You don't need anybody to tell you. And they put a little drop of ghee on it. Mmm. Very nice. So Krishna consciousness is directly perceived by the practitioner. If it wasn't, trust me, I wouldn't have stayed in the temple two days. But little by little by little by little, Krishna reveals. Just like you do the Bhagavad Gita Yagya every year here, right? You do the whole Gita. I do it in Los Angeles. 11th, right. It's a day after the actual day. So, I know for so many years doing that, leading the chanting, when you start off, it looks like, oh my God, this is going to take all day. And chapter 1 is a little rough. But by the time you get to chapter 7, it's like, wow. You start to get some... And by chapter 18, it's like, hurry bowl. And when you finish the, eight, the last verse, you feel different. I don't know about you, but me, every year I have to do that Bhagavad Gita Yagya. By the time the final shloka is chanted and then uh, Rabindranath in L.A. tells everybody to stand up, you're a completely transformed individual and it lasts a long time. I'm floating for several days doing that Bhagavad This Krishna consciousness is scary because it actually is real. That's the scary part about it. It is real. Krishna is real. Karma is real. These are not just hocus pocus or things we just tell, you know, fairy tales. No, this, this science of... Who is reading Krishna book? Who is reading that book? That is the greatest book. That book made me a devotee. That book. That's the book that made me a devotee. After I finished reading the first six chapters. After reading how Krishna killed Putana, I closed the book. Okay, I'm joining Prabhupada's army. So, Sanat Kumar is saying, the goal for the welfare of human society is detachment from the bodily concept of life and increased and steadfast attachment for the Supreme Lord. And to find out who is the Supreme Lord, you read Bhagavad Gita. That will convince you. Mattak parataram nanyat aham savasya prabhava Mattak sarvam pravartate and other verses. The whole purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to convince you that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Aham adhirhi devanam. Shloka after shloka, the conclusion is Krishna is the Supreme Lord. He's transcendental beyond the modes of material nature. Therefore, we chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May Krishna bless you more and more.